Welcome, welcome to Pentecost today. Larry Sparks here. And, you know, I've discovered that maybe one of the keys to actually seeing revival or the move of the Holy Spirit is to just keep on going. That's a word for somebody right now. From the outset of this broadcast, the word for you might be just keep on going. Because Psalm 23, which we're all familiar with, which I'm not quite sure we why, to be honest, we read Psalm 23 at really sad morning times. I, I, I understand it brings peace, but Psalm 23 talks about something. I feel the Holy Ghost, man. We're, we're diving in. And I, I, I didn't even have this on my notes, but can I just minister for a minute? I feel like the word of the Lord right now to somebody is keep going. Keep going. Psalm 23 says what? Yea, though I die in the valley of the shadow of death. No, I mean, we're quite familiar with what it says. Though I go through the valley of the shadow of death. Let me know where you're watching from right now. Let me know, again, from the first moments of this broadcast, where you're watching. And if you just need a prayer of encouragement, a prayer where you just feel like things are tough, I do. I feel the Holy Spirit saying, Larry, yeah, you, you get, to get to your teaching, whatever, but minister to the people right now. If you just feel like it's a tough time, I actually, and I'm, I'm giving this word because I was just talking to a pastor who shared this with me, and it really encouraged me, gave me some perspective, is that this pastor told me that they were experiencing a lot of opposition and adversity. Is that anybody right now? You feel like there's a lot of opposition adversity coming against you. You feel like the enemy is coming in all different directions. And I'm not trying to over-spiritualize things. You just feel like almost you can't get a break. And it was interesting. This guy was telling me, this pastor was telling me about their church and they were dealing with a lot of different stuff. But then he told me something that gave me perspective. And I believe the Lord's going to give you perspective right now on May the 4th. May the 4th be with you. <laughs> well, may the force of the Holy Ghost be with you. And the pastor said this. He was talking about all these bad things that were happening. It was just a difficult time. And he said, but we're pioneering something. Right now, I believe there's people who are watching and you're going through a lot of adversity and difficulty, not because you're doing something wrong. You're doing something right. And the Lord wants you to know there is grace for you to keep going. This might not feel good at first, but I'm going to say it over you anyway. Jesus is asleep in the boat. You feel like Jesus is asleep? He is. You're like, Larry, that's not the encouraging, consoling word I needed. It feels like Jesus is asleep. And here's this guy coming on video telling me that he is. Yeah, you know why he's asleep? Please, 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 please hold on to this. This is a word that when the Lord spoke this to me, it changed my life. Sometimes it feels like Jesus is asleep in the storm. Do you know why? He is not intimidated by the storm. Somebody just needs to hold on to that word right now. You feel it. I'm not pretending you don't feel all the stuff coming against you, but Jesus is not rattled. Jesus is not shaken by your storm. Could you imagine if Jesus was actually rattled and shaken by your storm? He feels compassion towards you. He was always moved with compassion. He emotionally relates to you because he was, he was tempted in all ways like we have been. But Jesus is not rattled. Somebody needs to just hold on to that word and declare that over you. Jesus is not rattled by your family situation. Jesus is not rattled. He is not shaken by the child who is obviously going in a direction that makes you very concerned, going away from the Lord. Jesus is not rattled by that financial problem. Jesus is not shaken. He cares. These are two words you need to know. He cares, but he's not shaken. He cares, but he's not rattled. Because remember when the disciples were in the boat with Jesus, they said, don't you care that we're sinking? He cared, but he was not rattled and he was not shaken by the circumstances around them. And then he spoke to the storm. That's what we're going to get into in a minute. This is totally different direction, but I see how the Lord's bringing it all together. Jesus did what? He spoke to the storm, peace be still, and it was silence. And then do you know what Jesus did after that? Because, you know, the disciples did all the right things, didn't they? You know the story. The disciples in the boat, the storm hits. Jesus is sleeping in the bottom of the boat. He is unshaken. He's unrattled. Uh, the disciples are like, aren't you just, aren't you going to, uh, don't you care that we're all going to sink and drown and die and the boat's going to bust apart? And there you are sleeping, Lord. So they wake up Jesus. Jesus intervenes. 
makes the storm go away. And you would think Jesus would be like, thank you for waking me up so I could solve the problem. Get ready for this one. A lot of people are praying and asking Jesus to do things. Now, you got to hear me. Otherwise, you're going to hear the wrong thing. A lot of us are asking. No, not, not asking. We're begging. We're crying out. And there's a pl- Listen, there's a place for b- the crying out. I just did a whole article on the power of the desperate cry. So there is a place for that. I'm talking about for some of you right now, you've got the enemy coming against you. You're dealing with a financial issue. You're dealing with a relational issue. You're dealing with a prodigal child. You're dealing with a spouse who's far away from the Lord. You're dealing with a health situation. You're dealing with something that the Bible has something very clear to say about. You're dealing with something that Jesus has something very clear to say about. When we actually look at how Jesus dealt with situations and storms and sicknesses and oppression and torment, we see very clearly what he said. We see very clearly what he did. And you know what the invitation is? For you to do what he modeled. It's not you. It's not Larry doing it. Sometimes we're asking Jesus to do what he wants to do in and through you. You've got to wrap your mind around that because we don't want to get it off. We don't want to think we are called to solve the problem. We are not. We are incapable. I'm incapable of healing anybody. You are as well. I'm incapable, believe me, of delivering anybody from any kind of torment, addiction, or demonic oppression. I can't do it. Only Jesus can. Okay? But sometimes we are crying out, oh, I feel the Spirit of God on this. You've got to get it. We are crying out like the disciples in the boat. They were in the boat with Jesus. They were in the boat with the one who had given them power and authority to cast out evil spirits and heal the sick. They were in the boat with the one who had the solution to every problem. You're not just in a boat with somebody. Jesus, through the Spirit of God, lives inside of you. He is looking for you to do something about the storm. He is looking for you to do what he would do by partnering with the Holy Spirit, who is not out in outer space somewhere. You're not trying to beg Holy Spirit to come down from heaven. You've received the Holy Spirit. Therefore, you must partner with him and say what Jesus would say about the situation. I'm not talking about name it, claim it, and blab it and grab it stuff, okay? Although I did hear one person say one time, I'd rather name, listen, I'd rather name it and claim it than doubt it and live without it. Someone, somebody shout. Now, when I say that, though, I'm very careful. I experienced for several years the worst of the worst when it came to positive confession, name it, claim it, theology. The principle is not wrong because I actually believe we are supposed to be a church that when we pray something, when we say something, when we decree something, it happens. Larry, but it often doesn't. Do you know why it often doesn't? Is we are asking a miss like James talks about. Um, We're, 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 crying out for things that we want to spend on our own fleshly, carnal desires. We're turning God into a genie, or like Joyce Meyer says, we're turning him into a celestial Santa Claus. We're making God our butler. I mean, I literally went to a church at one point, which will remain nameless, where one of the teaching series was this, and this was ghastly and atrocious. How to get whatever you want, need, and desire from God. God is not a genie in a bottle, and to the degree that we treat him that way, I believe we will bypass and we will live beneath every blessing, grace, and supernatural empowerment that he wants to release to us and through us. That is one of the two reasons why we're not seeing a full measure of the supernatural and revival, whatever we want to call it, released to us. Please, you got to hear me. Either number one, we are teaching things like cessationism, like the Holy Spirit doesn't move anymore with power or sign gifts and healing and deliverance and speaking in tongues. I mean, we've heard that. Praise God, there's enough reputable theologians who are uh, disputing and debunking cessation theory. It's not even cessation theology, it's a cessation theory. So that's one side of the ditch. The other side of the ditch, though, which is just as dangerous, and I've been there, is what I'd call hyper faith. And that is where you have this imbalance, name it, claim it, blab it, grab it. Basically, I'm going to order God around with my words and tell him to do whatever I want and have him fill my pockets with money and and all this nonsense. Okay. He wants to provide for you. He wants to heal you. He's a good father. We, We get all that. But do you know what he wants to do? And this is a scripture that a lot of people don't talk about when it comes to decrees. But I want to give you two. Originally, it was going to be one. 
I want to give you two Bible verses that bring clarity to this question of decree, declaration, confession, because by the way, it's a real principle. By the way, the Lord spoke and the worlds were formed. And likewise, we are called to be imitators of God, imitators of Christ. Okay. So I believe we are supposed to decree and declare things. I believe that the church is God's legislative spiritual authority in the earth is actually meant to say things and pray things and those things actually happen. So the key is, how do we get there? What is the Bible secret, the Bible key to actually making decrees that work? Let's start here at John 6, verse 63. Now, John chapter 6 is one of those controversial portions, I think, of the Gospels. When I say controversial, controversial to Jesus' audience at the time, particularly the religious crowd. Why? It's in, it's in the context of John chapter 6, where Jesus basically says, before Abraham was, I am. And, you know, that obviously caused quite a stir there. Actually, I, I think it's there in John 6. This is where he says, I'm the bread of life. I just want to make sure I'm giving you the right thing. Uh, yes, because it's in John 7 where he talks about the Holy Spirit. So, needless to say, yes, it's in John chapter 6 where he makes a lot of controversial statements that the religious crowd of the day doesn't like. But one of the things he says, which I think is very powerful, is in John 6, verse 63, Jesus says, It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and they are life. Jesus says, The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. When you say what Jesus says, when you say words that God says, okay, and the only way you're going to know what God says is knowing what he says in this word and not taking things out of context, not manipulating them. It's two things, actually. If you want to know what God says, if you really want to know the word of God, you need to read this with the Holy Spirit. You need to read this as a, as a person who's in love with the author. You can't be reading this just for a list of principles. Because if you're reading this for a list of principles, you'll take things out of context, twist them around, and use them for your own devices. But if you read this as a person who's in love with the author, and if you read this as a person whose desire, like Jesus talks about in John 14, 15, 16, your desire is to abide in him. Jesus says something very shocking. He says, abide in me, you abide in me. And my words abide in you. We're talking some different scriptures when it comes to decreeing and declaring, but I believe these are absolutely foundational. Jesus basically says, if you abide in me, if you remain in me, if you remain vitally connected to me, but then he talks about if my words remain and abide in you, you can ask whatever you wish and it shall be done. But you know, that invitation, it's a bold invitation, is actually linked to a foundation. The invitation to ask God whatever, which I don't believe the church has even come close to asking God for the fullness of what we could ask him for. But I believe that it is vitally linked to what Jesus's words abiding, remaining in us, us actually feasting on his words. And I want that be, to be the invitation to you tonight. You know, we're talking about May the 4th be with you. We did a whole promotion today because, you know, number one, we are a company that likes Star Wars and science fiction. How many, how many, let's get fun for a minute because we're going to just jump all over the place. We prayed and we're teaching and left and right. And now we're going to talk about Star Wars. How many Star Wars, Star Trek fans do we have here watching now? And hello, Facebook friends. I didn't even greet you all properly. We just all jumped on in, but I love it. Facebook friends, Destiny Image, YouTube, hello, welcome, Star Trek, Star Wars. I don't want to actually start a fight. We could because I know that people on both sides are very strong. I actually love Doctor Who, and I like classic Doctor Who. I'm not going to go into that because I'm, 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 losing, I'm losing people right now. They're like, oh, my gosh, this guy is on here talking about Star Wars and Star Trek and Doctor Who. So... Needless to say, for May the 4th, May the 4th be with you, we did kind of a company-wide uh, broadcast, not, not a broadcast, but we did kind of an emphasis. And I felt like, Lord, what's, what's one of the supernatural forces, if we're going to use some Star Wars language, forces that we all operate in that we need to understand more? And I felt like the Holy Spirit highlighted me the force of the decree. 
the force of the decree. So come on, Star Wars fans. So we did a little email today, and we did an article. I, I wrote a thing about the force of de the decree, and that's where the Lord reminded me of John 6, verse 63, where that is a foundational verse where Jesus says, my words. That's the emphasis there. If we want to make decrees and declarations and confess things and all that good stuff, which is biblically accurate, if we want to do that and it actually produce results, we need to say what Jesus would say. And in order for us to say what Jesus would say, I'm going to, I'm going to finish this off reading one more little bit. Well, yes, I'm going to read one other bit, but it's going to be something completely different than I thought. If in order for us to say what Jesus would say, we need to abide in him. We need to remain in him. He can't be a formula. That is the thing about confession, declaration, decree, whatever we want to call it. Name it, claim it. That's the thing that grieves me when people turn God into a formula, and that will never do. And the reality is those people, even though that they're using all the right formulas, or so they think, they will always evade. They will always miss the success I believe they want to have. Why? Because they are turning God into a vending machine. God is not a, a vending machine. God is a person. God is holy. We don't have a relationship with him because of what he can do for us. If he never did another thing for me, we are forever, not only just satisfied, we are forever explosive Wow! in praise and worship to him because of the cross, because of redeeming us to him, because we were dead in sin. And apart from the work of the cross, we would be dead. We would be alienated from God in this life. And we would be separated for, from God for eternity in a place called hell. So praise God for the cross. If he never did another thing for us, that is more than sufficient. That is worthy of extravagant worship and explosive praise. But praise God, he has left us on this earth. He's given us the gift of the Holy Spirit. We have the scriptures. And if we want to make decrees and declarations and confessions and all those kind of things that produce something, here is the foundation. Can I read this? And then we're done. John chapter 15, because I kept quoting this and citing it. I felt like the Lord said, you know what? How do you get to John 6, 63? In other words, remember Jesus says, my words are spirit and life. Well, how do you know what his words are? How do you know what Jesus would say about a situation? How do you know what Jesus would say about a sickness? How do you know what Jesus would say about a son or daughter who's gone away from the Lord? How do you know what Jesus would say about who's somebody who's wrapped up in addiction and torment and bondage and depression and fear and worry and anxiety. How would you know what Jesus would say about it? Because if you don't know what Jesus would say, I wouldn't struggle or waste my time praying a bunch of goofy prayers. What? Yes, we pray goofy prayers sometimes when we don't know God's clearly revealed will about something. We pray these religious sounding prayers. Listen, okay, I'm just going to say it now. There is a time to pray if it be thy will. When we clearly don't know the will of God, it is absolutely right to pray if it be thy will. Although, can I just encourage you that rather than just going around feeling like we're pious, saying, well, if it be thy will, do you know what we need to do? David had a process. David, in the Old Testament, you know what he did? He inquired of the Lord. I was encouraged recently because I was facing a decision and I didn't quite know what decision to make. And I'm like, well, and, and you know what my language is? This is default language for us Christians. So I'm pointing the finger at myself as a bad example. I went around to people that I trust. I'm like, oh, pray for me, brother. Pray for me, sister. Pray for me, pastor. And praise God for my spiritual father, pastor. He was like, Larry, why don't you inquire of the Lord? So I want to encourage somebody. You know, you're facing a decision right now. Oh, man. I do. I feel like the Lord is saying, Larry, you got to release this because you are in the process of this. You're facing a decision right now. And you've actually asked enough people to pray for you. I don't feel like, God. listen, it's fine to have people praying for you. But I feel like you, you are, you're actually experiencing a level of torment because you don't know what decision to make. You're in a place of indecision, lack of clarity. It's almost like either way could be the right way. I don't know if this is relating to anybody. I'm trying to be as specific as the Holy Spirit is allowing me. It's like either way could be the right way. You just don't know what way to go. Your heart is tender toward the Lord. You want to make the right choice. You just don't know which direction. And 
like me, it's like, well, pray for me, brother. Pray for me, Larry. Pray for me, friend. You know what the Lord is saying? It's like, I want you to inquire of me. What does that mean? It means actually intentionally take a season, maybe fast a meal or two, or fast social media or something, to go after God with intentionality, not sitting around throwing up this pious language that we use sometimes. And again, there is a time for us to pray. There is a time for us to ask for prayer. But then there's a time to actually intentionally, persistently inquire of the Lord, say, Lord, I need you to give me clarity. I need you to show me. I need you to give me, um, help me to have a conversation that confirms whether a door is open or closed. Father, I'm inquiring of you. I'm seeking you. It's, it, it demands a level of intentionality, more intentionality than just saying, well, pray for me. Does that make sense? I, I pray that that would bless you. But, that, but finishing up with John 15, Jesus says this, John 15, verse 1, I'm reading from the English Standard Version of the Bible, probably my favorite translation. I believe one of the most accurate translations, but there's a lot of good ones. English Standard Version, ESV, John 15, verse 1, Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it but might bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Verse four, this is what I want to focus on. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide, remain vitally connected to me. We remain vitally connected relationally to Jesus. Verse five, he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. From apart from me, you can do nothing. And I love this. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown. Well, I don't love this part because this is scary. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. But verse 7 is where we get the foundation for what I've been talking about, about effective decrees and declarations. And this is where I'll end, is John 15, verse 7. Jesus says, if you abide in me, remain in him, vitally connected relationally, talking to him, listening to him. And we do that in the context of prayer, reading the word, relationship with Holy Spirit. If you abide in me and my words, my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. May I suggest to you that when you remain in Jesus like that, when you are vitally connected to him, he says, ask whatever you wish. Your wishes, your desires will actually be shaped and impacted. Why? My desires were shaped and impacted and continue to be as I'm in relationship with my wife. As we are in relationship with people, the closer the relationship, closer the fellowship with somebody, the more that person has an impact on our wishes, our desires. And I want to declare to you right now, the more that you have relationship and communion and conversation and interaction, come on, just receive that right now, Jessa, in Jesus' name. Electricity in your left hand. I, you know, this is the Holy Spirit. Just even the power of his word and my encouragement remain vitally connected to Jesus. And guess what? You will ask whatever you wish and what you wish actually is impacted and influenced by your relationship with him. And we are in that place where what we wish is what he wants. And when we ask for it, what does it say? Ask whatever you wish. And it will, not might, it will be done for you. I do need to read verse eight because this is glorious. By this, by what? Come on, you gotta, you gotta get this in your heart. By this, us asking for something, us asking for what we wish and it happening and coming to pass by that, by answered prayer, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Father, I thank you. I feel the Holy Spirit. See, I mean, for, for some of you who are watching right now, I, I just sense that we are experiencing the presence of the Holy Spirit. Hey, Jody, nice to see you. See some folks on here I recognize. Father, I thank you. We'll just take the last couple of minutes because I don't want to do these ever more than 30 minutes. I thank you, Father, for the privilege. Just receive right now. I, I feel like there's a wonderful presence of the Lord. Come on. For Jessa, we just ask for more, Lord. God, God's sovereign over this. You know, nobody's bopping you on the head praying for you. This is the presence of the Lord. 
And I believe God's actually inviting many of us into a greater dimension of quo, quality relationship. He's saying, I'm, demand, I'm placing a demand on the quality. <clears throat> what does that mean? Often we think quantity means qual- quality. We think when you hear a message like this, abide my words, and my words abide in you. Oh, Jesus, I'm going to just spend five hours in the Bible. Now, if, if you want to, that's great. But you know what? Here's my prayer is that whatever time you give him, because some of you are busy. And I never want us to be too busy for the Lord. Okay, I, I, So we got to have a balance. He's always worth time. He is always worth consecrated time. He, he is worth that. But for the, new, for the new mom, for the seasons where it's just busy, 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 you know what? I want to encourage you. Whatever you give him from a pure heart, he will fill it. He will fill it. He wants to fill it. If you have five minutes where you've got kids and breakfast going and all that, you got work, you got many things. God knows he's not, a, he's, he's not against that. But if you take five minutes, go into the bathroom and say, God, I'm just going to take, I'm just going to lift up this time to you. You bring in a, the Bible, you bring in something and say, God, I'm just going to press in. I'm going to give you five minutes. I'm going to give you 10 minutes. Again, I, I do believe we can carve out more. I'm not going to give you a number. You know, it's foolish to do that. He's, he's looking for the quality. He's looking for people who are aware of his presence all day. Father, I pray right now for everyone watching for an increased awareness of your presence. Whoa. Huh, I feel that as we go throughout our days, I pray just because of what you, God, what you are depositing through this broadcast right now, God, I'm not doing it. I'm just trying to be sensitive to what you're saying and doing because of what you're depositing and releasing through this broadcast right now. I pray in the name of Jesus for everybody watching and listening. You just receive this, just receive it. You might want to just stretch out your hands. Here's the prayer that you would actually have an experiential awareness of what it means to abide in Jesus. In other words, you are aware of his abiding presence in you. You are aware of Holy Spirit around you. You are aware of the voice of the Lord that's speaking to you, that the Lord, even as you're going throughout your day, would highlight things to you from the word. He'd highlight prophetic words. He would highlight people or situations he wants you to pray for. We can't pray for everything all the time. But you know what? To be unceasing in prayer means we are unceasingly sensitive to the Holy Spirit, unceasingly listening and in tune with Holy Spirit, abiding in Him. And guess what? When we abide in Him, we remain in Him, we can ask whatever, we can decree whatever, because that abiding, that relationship, that constant place in His presence actually shapes and directs what we say, what we pray. We're not going to just be declaring and decreeing and naming, claiming any old thing we want. We will say the kind of thing that God is saying. So thank you, Lord, for that increase of awareness. Father, that abiding in Jesus would not just be a Bible concept. I pray that what we just read about tonight, abiding in Jesus would be a, wow, a burning everyday reality for every, I mean, 85 people watching right now across all platforms. You're watching now, maybe you're watching later. That is my prayer for you. You might just be tuning in right now. I'm tuning out. I got 60 seconds left, but my prayer for you is that what Jesus talks about in John 15, abide in me, remain in me. It would not be words on a page. It would not be a nice theological concept. You would actually experience the living presence of Jesus through the Holy Spirit remaining and abiding with you every moment, every day. In the name of Jesus. Woo! Amen. Amen. Okay. Praise God. How many? I mean, I felt the presence of the Lord on that. Let me know if Holy Spirit was speaking to you through that. Um, A great resource on, I'd say, a Bible balance resource on um, decrees and declaration. It's called Decrees That Unlock Heaven's Power. It's 40 Bible based decrees. Well, it's 40 subjects. There's a lot of Bible based decrees in this. One of the best books out there on the subject that I know by Tommy and Miriam Evans. It's available wherever books are sold. Amazon, they're just two people I think the world of, and thus I trust whatever they write. So, decrees that unlock heaven's power. And then also, just to let you guys know about some exciting things that are coming up. Um, Number one, oh goodness, it's uh, May 17th, 18th, and 19th in Branson. I don't know how many of you live near Branson, Missouri. 
or close to Branson, Missouri. But we will be up at Morningside Church, which is the home of the Jim Baker Show. And me, Tommy and Miriam Evans, Jesse and Parker Green are going to be doing a Pentecostal fire mini conference gathering there for a couple of days, uh, May 17th through 19th. It's free. You can go to the Jim Baker website and get more information about that. And then we'll have more information about this soon. But for anybody in South Florida, okay, I'm going to do this call and then I'm done. Anybody live in Florida, South Florida, please let me know. We have a lot of people, obviously, who come to the meetings that we've done there. We've done meetings there for eight years in South Florida, actually, out of Covenant Center International in Palm Beach Gardens. Um, but Pentecost weekend, mark your calendar. I forget what day. I think it's like June 3rd, 4th, 5th, that type of thing. Pentecost weekend is going to be a special weekend in Palm Beach, South Florida. So if you are around, we will be announcing soon some of the events coming up. But uh, myself, Tommy, and Miriam Evans are going to be partnering with Chauncey Crandall, Dr. Chauncey Crandall, cardiologist who saw a guy raised from the dead, um, walks in signs and wonders, known him for 11 years now. And he is going to be hosting and leading two nights of miracles, healings, and revival right in downtown West Palm Beach. So anyway, we will have information about that coming out, but that is going to be powerful. I believe God is breaking open cities and regions and entire states for revival in the days ahead. So anyway, just letting you know about that. Come on. All right. You're in Boynton Beach. That's a, oh yes. You'll be at the flood in the sand. Yes. We've got the floods coming up in the Kansas city, the sand. Um, but that will be, yes. It, when is the conference in West Palm beach? It's that first weekend of June. And if you go to Chauncey Crandall, I'll, I'll, I'll be putting up more information about it. Um, but it's two nights. It's a Saturday night and Sunday night. So we'll put all that information up and we'll probably do a, bi a video next week. So everybody will know about it. But just stay tuned. First weekend of June, Pentecost, Pentecost weekend. All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining tonight. We look forward to talking to you soon.